And well, hi, we're live. Um, I'm Chuck Pearson from Tuscan College in Greenville, Tennessee. We are virtually connecting on site at Alt C in Liverpool. And what I'm going to do is throw it to um, throw it to Sheila McNeil, who's going to introduce our people on site. Hi, everybody. Hi, Chuck. I'm really glad to be back with you today. Um, I'm Sheila McNeil, as Chuck said. I'm just going to let everyone in the room introduce yourself. Again, we've got another dream team today to talk with everyone. So looking forward to it. Hi everyone, I'm Martin Weller from the Open University. I'm being one of the on-site buddies here. Uh, hi, I'm Pete Olsen. I'm a Director for Loan Solutions for Laureate and the Co-Chair for Alt C this year. I'm Sean Bain. Um, I'm from the University of Edinburgh and I was the keynote this morning. Hi, and I'm Debbie Holly. I'm the Professor of Learning Innovation at Bournemouth University and really pleased to be here. Thank you all so much. Um, let's go ahead and start the virtuals getting introduced. We'll start with Anne-Marie. Hi there, I'm Anne-Marie Scott. I am from the University of Edinburgh as well. I work in our central learning, teaching and web area. And I have the pleasure of working with Shan and many of her colleagues. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Um, let's go to Autumn. Hey everybody, my name is Autumn Keynes and I'm coming to you for com from Columbus, Ohio right now. I'm a co-director of Virtually Connecting. And next we'll go ahead, I see Clarissa was able to get in. Sorry, I haven't tested anything. Can you all hear me? You're good. You're good. <laughs> all right, good. Um, my name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and I am in New Mexico. I'm coming to you from Albuquerque and I teach at uh, Central New Mexico Community College. Thank you very much. Um, Graham, you're next. Graham, uh, Graham has lost audio. We'll come back to you if we, if we get you back, Graham. Um, let's go ahead and go to Simon now. Hello, everybody. I'm Simon Ensor. I'm uh, an English teacher at the University Clermont Auvergne, which is right in the middle of France. Thank you so much, Simon. We'll go to Tanya. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tanya uh, Doria Elias. I'm here from, I don't even know where, Kamloops, British Columbia, and I work at Thompson Rivers University. <laughs> Very good. And um, Wendy? And ha Wendy's logged in, but we've lost Wendy's audio as well. Um, Graham, did we get you back? I'm back in. You are back in, sir. Um, go, can you introduce yourself real quick? Sure. My uh, name is uh, Graham Steele from Glasgow, Scotland. So not uh, that far away from the event in person. My, my interest is mainly in uh, open science, but uh, I'm also interested in things like open education. So I'm joining this event to learn a bit more about OER. Very good. Um, and we'll see if we can get Wendy back um, on audio later. Um, we'll just go ahead and go back on site now. Um, Sean, you had a keynote this morning um, that I have heard absolutely nothing about. So um, yeah, any orientation um, that you can give uh, Clueless Tennessean this morning? <laughs> right, it's all available on the stream and it's all right. Anyway, um, okay, my, my keynote was about, it was called Data and Anonymity on Campus. And it started from uh, a research project that myself and colleagues at Edinburgh uh, did on the anonymous app, Yak. Um, by looking at that app, we came to some kind of interesting conclusions about how valuable anonymity or an anonymous spaces can be for our students um, in, in higher education. So our research kind of traced Yak as, as the app died. So it died slowly in 2016, really, until the point at which our research was um, just, just finishing. Um, it finally closed. And we found that the community that inhabited Yik Yak kind of died away. And some of the things that that community were using the app to talk about, like mental health, like peer support, um, like jokes, um, things that are really important to our university students, really no longer had a place where they could be discussed. So my talk then from that research went on to think about what we lose when we lose spaces for um, anonymous discussion on campus. And the, the theoretical kind of framework I suppose I was using was around surveillance capitalism and how 
you know, most, most social media environments kind of track and, and extract and profile our personal data and sell it on because that's how their business model works. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure Yikyak would have done the same if it could have found a way of doing it, but it didn't. It failed instead. But I think that says something about um, a, a, about the relative lack of value of anonymous data. Um, and so I was I really concluded my talk by saying that we need to this this was a valuable space and we need more spaces for anonymity, unreachability, um, um, and ephemerality as well on campus. We need to make these spaces happen for our students in one way or another. And my second main conclusion was that we need to educate our students against the kind of um, psychic numbing um, that happens when we kind of subject ourselves to surveillance capitalism, by which I mean when we click on a, you know, the terms and conditions to agree that Facebook or Twitter or whoever can use all our data in whatever way they want to do. We, do, we kind of know what we're doing when we click that agreement, but we don't, but we kind of numb ourselves to the consequences um, of sharing and allowing data, our de personal data to be used in that way. So I think for me, that's an educational project. We need to teach our students not only to be aware, but to find ways of kind of uh, resisting and subverting platform capitalism and surveillance capitalism um, in, the, in a data society. So that was a very brief summary of what I talked about. Good show, good show. Uh, the, the thing that immediately occurs to me is we, we've heard a ton about the drawbacks of Yik Yak and, and platforms of that sort that promote anonymous conversation and the, and the lack of inhibition that comes with anonymous conversation. Um, I don't normally hear anonymous conversation associated with benefits. Um, what are some of the benefits that come from having a platform for anonymous conversation in a campus setting? Shall I answer that or should I let someone else? <laughs> well, I, I could just say something. I just, um, I think, I think we probably all automatically assume that, Chuck. But I thought, unfortunately, um, illuminating for me was the research that you brought up, Shan, to show that actually there were probably more positive benefits and you know the voting down the community moderation that was in that space and that can exist can actually combat that so i think you know that's something that, and again maybe this goes back to the psychic numbing effect that we just presume that we can't control that, that kind of negative behavior so we don't allow for those spaces but there were some really interesting findings about the positive community aspects you know one of the things i was thinking around it was you know we need to be trusting our students and particularly in the UK, we're moving to this much more kind of student as consumer model. The partnership seems to be taking a different kind of way forward. And it's much more about, you know, controlling and financing things differently. And I really think that Sean's work offers some really interesting insights and um, ways in which we as academics can kind of challenge you know, the, the, the provision of bespoke acts and this is the, you know, the one way to do something. So really interesting um, way, way we can look at that. Yeah, I think that's why I took as well. I think that some of the questions Sean had were about, you know, I like to connect with people and I know what their real identity is and, and put the words in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know, what Sean was saying is that it wasn't that this is the only tool to have, but rather you know, students have different spaces and they're different spaces for the different things that and particularly for often young people in, in coming to education, they might want to explore different aspects of their personality and an anonymous space allows them to do so. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's just students. I think we all need yeah, those yeah, spaces yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. And I think that's something I was talking, we were talking about just waiting for coffee. I think it's very hard to be anonymous in an academic context yeah. because our whole professional credibility is not anonymous. So there's another kind of tension there as well. Mm -hmm. That's true, except for peer review. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, thank you. I forgot that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, another psychic number. That's too value anonymity for certain very yeah. functional yeah. things like that. But, yeah. yeah. I think for me, just to kind of pick on, on that idea of anonymity, I, for me, it is really important on campus because and I, and I look back to what I was asking Sean in the keynote this morning that students need that space to ask the really awkward questions that sometimes myself as an academic, I don't know the answer to. I might feel a little bit uncomfortable answering that question because I don't know, uh, particularly on issues around mental health and kind of student support. 
and give them that opportunity to allow those uh, to ask those kind of difficult questions to anonymously. They can get the answers back that they need without kind of exposing themselves to the, the situation that they're in. So for me, I definitely see um, a place for it on campus, that open space. And I take on board everything uh, Chan said this morning about the kind of the, the issues around the side of bullying as well. But the community seems to moderate it themselves for the most part very well. They did it in our study. I mean, I think that's the thing we can't generalise from one community, which would be the on campus Edinburgh undergraduate community, to all users of Yik Yak. So I think, I guess, Chuck, this was kind of what your point was relating to around some of those very negative stories that were quite high profile in the media around bomb threats, um, racist harassment, uh, victimisation of women, and so on. And I think those were, I mean, I did make the point this morning, those were really horrible, and those things have devastating effects for the people that are the victims of that. But the point I was making is that that isn't the only conversation to have about anonymous social media. There are lots of other conversations um, to have. And I think a political kind of underlying um, point that came through from my talk around that was if we, if we only focus on the moral panic around these apps, we're doing the work of platform capitalism because we're kind of, we're constructing anonymity in an entirely negative way. Um, so I think there's quite a, a, a interesting discussion to have around that. Actually, I would like to hear more about that from you because we didn't have such negative media coverage in the UK as you had in the US around that app. We did have a lot of negative um, media coverage around that and um, the campus that I was working at at that time actually had an interesting thing about a year beforehand. Um, there was a student who was, it was like his senior year, he actually, this is before Yik Yak, this is like a year before Yik Yak came out, he basically wrote a Yik Yak and he called it um, Anonymous Tweets. And it was a, uh, it wasn't an app, I think it was basically like maybe it was like an account with a shared password kind of thing, but it was a little more eloquent than that. It was like a website you could go to and you could just like put in and then it would send it to this Twitter account and it would tweet it out anonymously. Um, and it was fascinating, but yeah, it was, we saw a lot of people use it, um, you know, for harassment or for negative kind of things. And I don't know if that was just what got the most attention, I don't think that was the majority of the actual usage, if we would have run the numbers. Um, but the thing that always stood out to me about it too is that there was something, there's something I think to be said for digital literacy there. There's something to be said about just, you know, it's a horrible truth, right? That people would be offered a platform like that and then use it to harass one another, but it's still a truth nonetheless. And just shutting it down, just like, oh, cover it up, cover it up, shut it up, shut it up, right? Does that really work? Shouldn't we really kind of address the problem, <laughs> the real problem, right? Instead of just pulling the platform, um, really take a look at that hard human truth that people, when presented, some people, and maybe it was even the same person who was just really loud, right? You, you really didn't know. Um, you know, to have those hard conversations. Could we use that as an opportunity to have the hard conversation about what that means rather than just, oh, shut it up and cover it up? Yeah, I think that's a really important point because if, there, if there's harassment happening on Yik Yak or on Twitter or wherever, it's probably also happening in the lecture theatre or in the student bar or in the street, you know, so it's, a, it's an institutional problem. It's not necessarily or only a social media problem. Yeah, I, I mean, I know that I've been I've been thinking about this stuff a lot, and I think, you know, <laughs> less grumpy than I was yesterday. But I still think, you know, we we live in an ugly world, and and so it's it shouldn't be surprising that ugly things come to light um, on social in social platforms and social media. I think how we react to it and how we choose to deal with it is is all we've got, right? So we can either run away from it and 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 hide and be scared or we can find ways to, you know, positively address it, but, but not accept it, not tolerate it. And I think those are the challenges that really face us going forward. It's interesting to think about how, I mean, stuff happens everywhere, but about how different platforms allow it to happen or, or what, um, what they encourage to happen. And then you, you address some issues that they have and tried to at least to moderate some of that behavior. Mm -hmm. And there's interesting things to take with uh, 
we design our software and how it controls those things. Yeah, and in the context of universities in particular, in fact, Anne-Marie, I'm glad you're here because I was quoting you kind of um, <laughs> this morning. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, but in terms of thinking about how institutional kind of learning technologies might make spaces for anonymous and ephemeral content. Anyway, I'd, I'd, be, I'd really yeah. like to hear what your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I... I Thank you for mentioning um, the blog post I barfed out a few weeks ago. That was very kind of you. This idea of ephemerality has really been um, uppermost in my thinking because I, I, I feel a sort of tension inside the institution around the, the potential for harm with certain systems and the obligation to act. And, you know, and that's where a lot of the discomfort around anonymity comes from is the is the is feeling there's an obligation to act and then not really knowing how to act so i think there is something in there about uh, i really liked autumn's point about you know we should we should use these as teachable moments and thinking um a little bit more broadly than just how do we find this person and punish them which is sort of where the default thinking goes to um but i think ephemerality is is maybe the middle ground in this space in that you can have you, you can get away from some of the discomfort around anonymity um, and have a place where people are identifiable, but, but lower the barriers and lower the stakes right down. So you can do stuff, you can do stupid stuff. And I, I did watch a bit of your talk, Shan, and saw the question at the end around, um, around the process of getting to be a competent sort of digital user um, and, and sort of working out your digital identity and I think that's where these ephemeral spaces have real power. You can do stuff in a way that we can all kind of live with and then throw it away and it doesn't haunt you for the rest of your life. So I'd be kind of interested in where other people's thinking is around some of these ideas of ephemerality and because it's not something that a lot of our, I mean even our systems on campus support, let alone the horrors that are Facebook and Twitter and all those places. Uh, so I just had a question. I know Snapchat was mentioned. Is there any other platforms that allow sort of this ephemeral sort of connectivity? There are other anonymous apps. Um, so there's Whisper, which is I think probably the most used one, and there are various other. There are a couple of other campus-oriented ones, but those are. Those are focused on anonymity, not so much on ephemerality. As mm. Snapchat is the main example I can think of as a, of an ephemeral um, kind of social media application. Um, I'm trying to think what else there are. There aren't any sort of outstanding examples of this. I mean, Amory, when you, you were blogging this, you were talking about splots, and I know a lot of people have been talking about splots, which are they're not exactly ephemeral, but they're small and they can pop up, and they they have a commitment to not. Um, gathering personal data, um, so they're kind of little, I don't know how, how you describe them really, little nuggets of um, learnability, I don't know. You're, you're on mute, Amory. Total digital fail, thank you. Um, Tanya's got really good experience of using splots in her, um, it, because they, they've come out of Thompson Rivers where um, she's based, but um, I, I think one before maybe we talk about that a little bit more. One, just to the talk of Snapchat, one thing that really struck me with both Snapchat and Yik Yak is that they still have some sense of network and community in them. Snapchat is, is really based on building a really tight knit little group of people that you then have this kind of low stakes conversation with. Yik Yak, the geolocation element, has a similar sort of networking effect. So I, I think there is something in there about um, identity in the context of a network as well that's worth picking out mm -hmm. but i'll shut up tanya you may i don't know whether you want to say anything about splots i don't feel like i should talk for them when you're in the room <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean i think you know certainly that's something i've been playing with this year is, is and really using splots um which are i mean they're at they're a wordpress hack by alan and brian um that essentially just don't gather data and i've been really using them to try and um uh, collect what would be sensitive stories um, and, and hard stories uh, to both tell and to hear and, and to curate those as well. So, so I think that there's something to be said for um, the ability for people to tell stories and, and put them somewhere, but also that idea of curating them and, and, and instead of them being one story 
um, out in the world to bring them together because I think, you know, I mean, common experience has power. And I mean, that's been my experience with using squats is that pulling those things together has, has, has given ideas and, and people, I hope, power that as individuals, just one person um, against the world might not have. On the um, subject of uh, camera femininity, <laughs> <laughs> this is probably a question for Sean and uh, Anne Marie. I wonder whether, particularly if the person's ID is non persistent, whether it encourages or discourages kind of that very negative behaviour, because in some ways what those trolls want is reputation and stuff. So, so if it doesn't, if it, if it doesn't exist anymore and they can't maintain an ID with that discourage or would it encourage it because they can just come in and be nasty and disappear type of thing. Yeah. I, I, I don't know because you can't track trolls. No, it's not, it's not <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah. Uh, but you said like you were finding there was a very small amount of that kind of behaviour mm -hmm. when that was because uh, it, you get to get down very quickly. Yeah. There's no point in putting up I suppose putting up their kind of like hot take on some horrible topic because it would just disappear and then they go yeah. back. They want it to persist because they want that kind of like yeah. notoriety or something. That's right. And again, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that comes back to the community issue that Anne-Marie raised. These things work well when there's a community with a sense of responsibility to each other, mm -hmm. even if they don't exactly know who the person they're speaking to at that moment is. Um, so I think that's a really interesting point. I'm not sure that these anonymous apps, if they weren't community-based and focused, would be quite, it would do the same work. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Reddit is the ultimate example of the the horrible, <laughs> unmoderated, anonymous pit of despair. But I wonder about the ephemeral nature. It's not your impact is is so much lessened. So, like, what's the incentive for a troll if if there's if anything they say is just going to be binned and thrown away? You know, we've sort of made a value. That's sort of a value judgment about about what's going on. That you know, that's it's the thing you're participating in that's important, not the, perhaps the product coming out of it. So anything you sort of spew into that space is is going to get thrown away. So I wonder whether that would reduce the you know, there's a sort of spectacle thing going on there, and it reduces the sense of spectacle to what's going on. So would the trolls would would it appeal in the same way as something like Twitter or? You know where you build up a reputation for being a bit of an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I can see how it would be appealing, but maybe like you said, in a different way. I don't think it would be appealing in the same way. But the idea that I could, you know, see something really horrible and then like, you know, just for a little while, and then like it would, it would then disappear, and then I, I don't know, could that, could that provide some kind of safety? Um, yeah. I, I find <laughs> Are we? Is it like a training ground for trolls? Is that what we might have? Like try out your trolley identity, and you know, do, try different try ways of being a troll, and work out what kind of troll you want to be, and that's a digital literacy, right? <laughs> but I do. Autumn. I do think it's interesting that we, we spend so much time, um, or, or the, the media, or the world at large, whatever, spend so much time um, really being very critical about how people, users, um, people who are, are on these platforms treat each other. But we are just now through you know, surveillance capitalism, through the conversation around platform capitalism and surveillance capitalism, starting to think about, wait a minute, what about the company that is collecting that data and what about what are they doing with that and isn't that kind of trolly that they're you know watching me and collecting and then sharing data with other people in the background and having these conversations about me to, to influence me to buy a certain product or vote a certain way or you know be a certain kind of, of person and we don't consider that trolling right that's just good business um, so there seems to be a bit of a, a I don't know, a bit of a, a something. Something is not right with that argument. 
Yeah, I would agree, but it's, it's almost like who gets to be who gets to be anonymous. You know, the algorithms that are harvesting our data and, and profiling us and repurposing our data are anonymous and run by anonymous teams of people, but we can't be anonymous. I, I agree, right. it's, it's, it's a power issue. Who has, who has the power to be anonymous? Yeah. There's a double standard there. Yeah. Well, we're about five minutes before the top of the hour. Um, I wanted to make sure I gave everybody on site to give other perceptions of how the conference is going so far. Um, P Peter, we've let Sean dominate this conversation. I'd like to hear what you've got going on. I'm just here to facilitate. That's why we're ringing the big names. <laughs> Go on, sorry, Chuck. What were you going to ask? Um, perceptions of the conference so far, things that you've heard over the course of the past day that um, that, 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 that are that have been beneficial to you? Um, I, I tweeted yesterday, I was generally overwhelmed by some of the stuff that I, I was seeing. I mean, it's been a long time coming to kind of get a conference to build some about 18 months of planning and, and kind of putting it in. And now that it's here, it seems a little bit, it doesn't kind of seem real. I'm, I'm, I was saying to, to Martin before, I'm kind of waiting for something to break, and such what it, it, it doesn't. But um, it, everything seems to be going on great. People are having a great time. We had a bit of a technical hitch yesterday, but I was kind of feeling a little bit down. But somebody came past and said, I'm having a really great time. And I was just like, wow, okay, then maybe there is a, a kind of a bigger thing as well. Uh, for me, um, and I spoke about it on the Edge Talk uh, last week, that for me, it's about the, the keynotes. And David Curden talks about something one key is that he, I think he mentioned it, it was interesting that we're not focusing on the tech, we're focusing on the kind of the bigger issues, obviously, which tech is a big part of it. And that was when we were kind of thinking around the theme for the conference, myself and Helen and Byron, that was the one thing we wanted to bring out is that, yeah, it is the kind of the, the learning technologies are part of it, but there are lots of bigger issues at play of which technology can help to solve these issues. And that's what we wanted to kind of address with the keynote. So I'm kind of seeing links with Bonnie's talk yesterday about the kind of the openness, and we've got uh, Sean today talking about the kind of the anonymity, and then Peter Goodyear tomorrow talking about the learning spaces and kind of how we can create those spaces for whether it's going to be for staff or for students. Um, and then underpinning all that is how the technology is going to be able to support that, or it might inhibit it. It might actually be a barrier for people to actually do so. For me, I mean, it, it's really difficult because I can't get around to every session uh, and I, want, I kind of want to see what's going on. And I almost feel like I have to be selfish and pick the things I'm interested in. But I always uh, chose sessions that I'm most interested in to make sure I can ask questions as well. So that's always my little selfish thing that I do to go in. But I've tried to keep a little bit more away from this so I can try and see a little bit more of what's going on. But yeah, just, I mean, we mentioned it the, the, uh, yesterday. It's this. The amount of uh, submissions we've had this year is on a record numbers for years. And I was saying to Helen, I'd like to think we've struck a chord with the theme that it's this island of innovation, people kind of working necessarily on their own in the little cells, and, and how we bring that all back together because of the institutional implications. It was something uh, during the time in Liverpool that we were really uh, kind of hit, hit with, that lots of people do great work across the institution, but since we try to scale anything up, everything kind of grounds to a halt. So, I wanted to kind of see what are other people doing, what the challenges are, are we are the same people, are so we having the same challenges, uh, how are people kind of doing these sorts of things, how are we getting past institutional barriers, and, and for me it's around the kind of the policies, that's what I'm interested in, is these kind of, these written texts that people are expected to navigate their way through, and I was talking about kind of language and, and this sort of stuff, and just see what everyone else thinks about these sorts of problems to kind of move forward, and that, yeah, there is a learning tech conference, but technology is not the only thing, there's lots of other kind of bigger issues going on. That's my take on it anyway. Outstanding. Um, anybody else in the room have observations they want to share as we get to close to the top of the hour? Um, I suppose just, just one last thing for me. I think Pete's raised some really interesting points about this not being about technology. And I think that's what all it all is a community and that's why it all works because mm -hmm. it is about people. And I think it's really important to have keynotes like Bowen and Chan to raise these, these issues because ultimately what we're talking about now is about power and how we work in within, around, above and below these kind of power structures. So I think one thing that's um, striking me see, I think that the level of criticality is being raised mm -hmm. around these issues, which is great. I think it's there at OER 17 this year as well and it's coming through and I think it's really really particularly when we're talking about um, 
social spaces and spaces that institutionally we don't control and the tensions there. We, th these are the conversations we as a community need to be having so that then we can articulate that back in our institutions and then come back together and continue the conversations. Outstanding. What, have, we, have we served the room well? Have we served the online fo folks the way we need to? Have we served you well? <laughs> oh, y'all been outstanding. Y'all been outstanding. We, we know you have a full day ahead of you. We want to let give you the chance um, to g keep going with your conference. So we want to thank Sean, Peter, all of you. We want to thank you for the time you've given today. Um, and and we'll let you guys get go. And if any of the virtuals want to keep hanging out for a few minutes and keep talking, um, we can certainly do that. Okay, that's great. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. So um, we, we, we can now have our post-game laugh fest um, the way we've been known to. Um, the conversation in the chat has been absolutely amazing. Um, and I haven't been paying a lick of attention to it because um, it, just, it launched off of splots and how we actually control what people see. And um, it feels like um, Anne-Marie and Tanya and Clarissa have been going back and forth um, every which way. Um, so um, do any of the three of y'all want to just jump in and elaborate a little bit on what y'all have been saying in chat? Um, okay, so I might jump in. Go ahead. Um, and I don't know if you guys can, can hear me. Um, You're fine. Tanya, uh, Tanya I need um, to know what splots are. I don't really get them at the moment. <laughs> I think that's my problem. Yeah, it's a good question and, and there are a bunch of things and, and uh, so they've been relabeled by somebody else, tiny teaching tools, which I think is a better descriptor. Um, so essentially they're small bits. Right now the ones that have been built have been built in WordPress and they're basically supposed to be a very small tool. So instead of a platform that does everything, they're one small tool that does one small thing. So there's one that collects writing. So all it does is you type in your writing. You don't need a login. You don't need a password. You don't need to create accounts. You can just log in. Um, there's another one that collects sounds. Um, there's one that collects art pieces. But what they really have in common is that there's no logins needed and there's no data collected in the background. Does that help? That helps 100%. Thank you. <laughs> and I think the thing that um, Sean had talked about, about her keynote that was really registering, um, was um, the importance of being able to have anonymous conversation and the importance of um, being able to engage in fashions that don't feed platforms um, and don't attach our identity to what, what, what we're communicating online. Um, and I, I, I resist anonymity a little bit because I've seen it in a different circumstances how anonymity can be po poisoned, but um, I, I like to talk about trusted conversation um, and how we value platforms where we can trust the people we're engaged with and trust how the platform's engaging with our, with our data. Um, so um, feedback on that. Um, I just had a, another angle that was going through my mind, which Please, was Dave, Dave Cormier's disposable learning objects, where you create a small thing and it serves its purpose and then it's gone. So mm -hmm. uh, you still have the ability to know who created it, but it, it's uh, something that's there and then, and then it's gone and he's... Uh, from my understanding of that, it's 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 useful. It's creating it for a purpose. It's it's having maybe having a conversation, but uh, it doesn't have to be there forever. And so I'm sort of curious that there this seems to be a gap in the app market that there's no uh, readily available place to do that because most things attract. Well, and from my, from this perspective, um, I, I wonder about the applicability of such disposable tools because um, 
institutions in under regional accreditation in the United States like to have that tracking. They call it assessment and we got to do it. Um, and that that's ultimately why wonder if we're pushing against um, that whole assessment regime that comes in with our accreditors wanting to do the business that they do. But you don't need it for learning. So mm -hmm. surely right. there's people that... Right. We, ultimately, we are talking about learning, and that's, and that's the business which we should mm. be engaged in. But um, our institutions like to get that little endorsement tag for, um, from, from our bodies. Go, Autumn. Oh. I, 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 or did um, I not hear Autumn? I thought I heard, I thought I heard you. Who, oh, Anne Marie, did I hear you? Yeah, it was possibly me. Sorry. No, <laughs> no it was just, I mean, I mean, I think. I think Wendy's point is bang on where I was with my thinking around this ephemerality angle. Um, and actually Snapchat is the, is the perfect example of a system that really balances up ephemerality and consent and, and a whole range of things. But it, is, it was the only example we could really think of earlier. So completely there's a massive gap there. Um, but I, when I was writing about it, and, and I didn't write very much, and it's something I want to explore further, but I was thinking that these ephemeral spaces, you can, this, this tension between tracking is something that's also in my mind and in the process of helping write institutional learning analytics policy, fun times. Um, well, European data protection law is changing, even more fun times. Um, but the, you could, I think there's a balance in here, basically. That, um, take an institutional blog, for example. You could capture information about what went on in that activity in terms of tracking if you wanted to feed some kind of analytics and still throw the blog itself away. Um, it's been interesting watching on Twitter some of um, Darcy Norman's tweets where he's been talking about students getting in touch to request that their blogs, institutional blogs are taken down because they're a couple of years out from university and they just don't want that debris hanging around behind them anymore. So I think there, there is something to be unpacked in that space about exactly what's ephemeral and what's not and where the balance is. And I don't think it's the same in every case, but it, it seems like there must be more nuanced opportunities open to us that sometimes we may take the product of an ephemeral activity and that could be a metadata product or that could be the actual output, but the process, the space in which the process took place is dismantled and thrown away. Um, yeah. That, that's that's what I think we need to unpack more to understand what, what we may and might build in this space, mm -hmm. because I think there's probably lots of different flavors we might want. So I think that we do have to move away from this idea that we need to track everything in the platform, right? That the platform needs some trackable spaces for accreditation or for um, testing or whatever, right? But what everybody knows, even just from on-campus experiences, not everything is tracked. Yeah, you have moments of testing. You have moments where you're put into a room and you are surveilled. There's someone who's looking over you, watching you while you take a test, right? But that's not the whole of your, um, you know, university experience. I mean, could you imagine if when you got up from a class, you went to the coffee shop and along the way you were having a conversation with a classmate about the, um, the lecture that you just heard, right? How much learning is happening there? But could you imagine if the teacher was following you and like taking notes and, and watching you while you were doing that? And why don't we have more respect? Why aren't we trying to build those um, informal kind of spaces inside of these platforms? Um, if, if for anything to also point out to students that out on the web in general, there are, you know, these spaces where they are being tracked. It's almost like there's no contrast. There's no place where you're not being tracked. So it just becomes the norm. It just becomes normalized. But that would be like saying our experience at university would just be going into a room and being tested. I, I'm pushing um, purely from the perspective of a person who is trying to help sustain an institution, um, but everything you're saying is accurate on it. Um, it we, we've managed to build a system where our institutions really aren't about learning. Our institutions are about doing the things that are necessary 
to sustain the institution and getting the checkoffs of the on the off the checkoff boxes that sustain the institution. Um, all the while, the actual process of becoming um, better humans, more human, um, it, be, better individuals, is falling through the cracks. Um, and how, how do we most effectively say, yes, um, in the midst of all these platforms, we need spaces where we can be more fully human? I, I'd like to challenge this business of trackability, that we actually need it. I would contest that. I don't think we need it. I think we need dialogue. I think, we, as Chuck says, we need more humanity. And I think then when we talk about these platforms, and we talk about labels like trolls, lurkers, moderators, call it what you will, I think actually we're falling into the trap of the platform itself. Yeah, I'll say that the reason why I say we need it is because of, you know, power structures that say that we need it. I agree with you, Simon. I don't think we really need it. <laughs> like, I guess, what do we mean by need? We don't need it in the way that we need food, right? What is the food for learning? It's not tracking and surveillance, right? Um, but unfortunately, at least in the United States, um, you know, we've got certain accreditations that we've got to meet. We've got certain, I've got people that I got to answer to, right? Who are like, hey, we need these numbers. So in that sense, um, I'm told that we need it, but I, I completely agree with you in reality. I don't think we really need it. I, can I offer a perspective as somebody who has the luxury of running a bunch of our IT systems? Please. Um, one, of, one of the questions or one of the queries I get quite regularly at my team answer are students who have IT problems, who, you know, they've missed the deadline for submitting an essay. And their tutor is asking us, do I fail this person or can you give me some proof that they were in the system at that point in time? Um, and so actually some of this data is, is, is in our students' interests to collect. The collection of data versus the uses of it, I think we have to separate these two things out. Um, I think there are issues about who collects the data and we run a lot of things on campus, so I'm maybe in the luxury position here <laughs> in that the data is not really going outside of our boundaries. Um, but I, I do think there there is a more nuanced picture in here than just track or not track. It's it's gather data and then what purposes are you using the data for? Um, and there are absolutely spaces where you don't want to gather any data at all. There are absolutely spaces where I think you gather some data because you're fulfilling some kind of basic service provision type functions. And then there's there's what might you repurpose that data for, which is where a lot of the learning analytics conversations come in. I think it's a spectrum. It's not, it cannot ever be either or. I'll shut up, Tanya. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I would just uh, amplify or, or agree with everything you said, Anne-Marie. I think, you know, where I work, I mean, one thing that we should track is, I mean, we create all these videos. Does any student ever watch them? Right now, we have no idea. So, I mean, mm. so, so there's, there's a balance on this stuff. Do we need to know which student watched which minutes and correlate that to performance? No. But, um, you know, there, so, so we get into this either or, and, and I agree, I think we need to think about, um, you know, the, the uses of these things and really get back to conversations about learning as opposed to, um, you know, what, what becomes these, these very, you know, you're either on one side of the fence or the other. And, and I think, you know, we need a lot more conversation across the spectrum. Okay, so I'll just jump in again real quick. Um, because this is this is a fascinating conversation. Thank you all. <laughs> this is really good. <laughs> um, I also think that it would be we, there would be something there would be something wrong. There'd be something um, not responsible to put students into an environment and normalize them to an environment where they wouldn't be tracked at all, and then send them out into a world where they are being tracked excessively right and i mean it, that's kind of a silly thing to say because of course those things happen simultaneously it's not like they're within the um the confounds of the university systems only at all times but but could we could we use this as an opportunity to better teach students 
using their own data by providing them with platforms where they do have situations where they're not being tracked to give them that juxtaposition. So that way they can realize how much they are being tracked when they use Facebook, when they use Twitter, when they're on the internet at large, right? Because they don't have anything to um, juxtapose, you know, because they don't see the contrast, it just becomes this normalized kind of thing. And I think especially in the situation, um, in the context of an institution, we have a great opportunity to let them use their own data, right? Give them their own data and let them see how much can be done with it, how much is being gathered, what it looks like, let them run the numbers on it. Um, I just think there's a great learning opportunity there that I haven't really seen anybody taking advantage of. Um, we're okay, guys, um, I'm ready. just about to go. Uh, so my kind of lighthearted exit uh, strategy is to show you my dragon. Uh, <laughs> so this is very ephemeral. It's face painting. It's not going to be there much longer. I... Uh, I can't say much about the purpose, but uh, let there be dragons. Bye. I think Wendy um, has a very appropriate last word, and unless anybody has any especially urgent last things to share, um, I think we can leave the broadcast at that point. Thank you, all of you, um, for the time you've given this morning. Um, we'll go ahead and from Greenville, Tennessee, we'll say goodbye.